Hi, and welcome to PHQ, questions from the personality hacker community. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. And let's get right to our question this week. Hi, team. This is Brandon. I'm a 26-year-old male business professional, and I land somewhere on the scale between an INFP and an INFJ. After your most recent uh, podcast episodes, I've been asking myself this kind of fork in the road question. My awareness seems to be growing every day at a exponential rate, but my maturity is growing at a linear rate. How am I supposed to fix this? I get that, you know, maybe meditation, things like that would be able to grow the rate of awareness. But if maturity is limited by time and duration that it takes to experience things out in the world, how are you supposed to change that into an exponential curve instead of a linear curve? I mean, no curve at all, right? Dictated by time. Uh, I'd love to hear conversation around this question. Thank you. Thanks, Brandon, for the question. So this actually goes back to a podcast we recorded a few months ago basically entitled Self-Awareness versus Self-Development, where we talked about just because you're aware, just because someone's aware of something doesn't mean they have necessarily had personal development around that or personal development in their life. You might have a very super hyper aware person that really knows what's going on in the world. They're very connected. They're on the internet. They're very connected to the social fabric and the social unconscious of what's happening. And yet there's not maturity that comes along with it. It's a great podcast. I recommend if you want to do a deeper dive, go listen to that because we unpack some of these ideas. And we were talking about that in the particular framework of millennials and how millennials show up to the world. Now, we're not picking on millennials, but we use that as an example. There are obviously people of older generations as well that have a lot of awareness but lack maturity with that awareness. So this is a great question, Brandon, and let's, let's unpack this a little bit. Right. I think the reason why we ended up talking about that is we've observed a propensity to excuse one's behavior by saying, well, at least I'm aware of it. In fact, I've heard that line a lot. Somebody admits something awful about themselves and another person will go, well, at least you're aware of it. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's why we wanted to create a distinction between awareness and development or, or maybe even conflating development with maturity. Now, the concept of maturity is, I mean, what what you know qualifies to be mature is a little subjective. Maturity is, I think the basically the classical definition of maturity is that you know how to behave appropriately to your environment or context. And so we have certain markers of maturity as a person ages. We don't expect a 10-year-old to behave the same way as a 16-year-old. And when a 16-year-old acts like a 10-year-old, we tell them to grow up. But when a 10-year-old acts like a 10-year-old, we think that they're doing fine. Yeah. And when an eight-year-old acts like a 10-year-old, we're excited about their progress. So maturity definitely has, a t you know, like there's a, there is an intrinsic tie between levels of maturity and your age. And, and that's just how it is when you're growing up. But I think when you get to about 26, when your mind is fully formed, which I believe happens around 25, is that your brain stops, you know, officially developing at 25. Of course, we learn things or we make new synaptic connections. But the maturation process of the brain ends around 25 years old. So after that, it becomes like we kind of expect adults to act a certain way. And then we don't have any more markers of achievements after that time period. I think the last time you really get a major privilege, you know, and being able to do something in society's eyes that you were not mature enough to do before is rent a car, which happens at 25. And then after that, all the other markers are things of like collecting social security, <laughs> like the, the ending phase of our lives. So 25 is about the age where we go, okay, well, you're a fully farm formed adult. You're a human. So go be human now. And there yeah. are, there are some people who get into arrested development at that point and they don't, you know, they don't really mature much after that point. And then there are other people who very clearly are still in the maturation process and don't feel like that ever ends for them. So I find your question to be actually a really good one because at 26, you're going, how do I accelerate my growth? How do I make sure that I'm becoming more and more mature? And at 26, it could be assumed that you've done all the maturing you're going to do and we'll slap you on your butt and send you on your way. So how I would define maturity, and you probably would agree with me, Antonia, is someone who takes responsibility for their thoughts, emotions, and actions, and full responsibility for those. In other words, they don't project those on other people. They don't say things like, well, you made me act this way, or you made me think this, or you made me feel this. 
you take full responsibility for what is in your domain as a person, what is under your sovereign control, you take 100%, 100% responsibility for those things. That's how I personally define uh, a mature person. Yeah, and I think that goes back into that classical definition of knowing how to behave appropriately for the context or environment. Yeah. Knowing how to behave means that you are self-referencing in your behavior and you're not looking to outside sources to determine that. So one of the components of maturity is independence, increased independence. And so what you're talking about with taking full responsibility means that in a situation where you are fully responsible for how you show up, for your behavior, your emotions, all the things you just mentioned, that means that you would be self-referencing. You would be referencing what you believe is the right course of action in this situation. And you can see why this you can see why we talked about this around the millennial generation. Again, not just limited to millennials, but the millennial generation has a lot of awareness, but they have a lot of collaborative frameworks. So it's a lot of collaborative if you look at a millennial's like YouTube channel, a lot of it's like a collaborative frame. They're asking for their viewers to input and things. So even creative things, creative endeavors around this generation is very collaborative. They're looking to the peer group to set the tone for where you're gonna go together. We had this discussion the other day. I always like all my Facebook posts when I make them. And a millennial friend of ours was saying, you can't do that. That's like totally self-serving. You look like a crazy narcissist. I'm like, why? I like what I wrote, so why wouldn't I do that? It's, it's a sense of like being tied to the collaborative frame of everyone else saying, you can't just be an outlier. You can't just like your own thing. We get to like it and tell you that it's valid. We get to tell you that's okay. And it's this difference of opinion, this difference of looking at how things play out that I think millennials often have hyper awareness, but also are looking to the others around them in a peer group to set the tone for what they're going to do. And I think that's such a great distinction between the the collaborative, or I think there is a great distinction between the collaborative mindset versus the codependent mindset. And I think there's a challenge that the generation is going to have with understanding that we do co-create. I mean, the collaborative nature of millennials is actually quite, I think, quite impressive. I love it. Yeah, I do too. I really do. Especially as like the cynical Gen Xer. <laughs> the Gen Xer that's like, well, I guess I have to do this on my own, right? Like that's, that's the generation I grew up in. And so the generation of millennials, which are very collaborative and co-creative, I, I very much admire it. But there is a distinction, just like with Gen Xers, and they, the distinction that we had to make was between being independent versus being like cynical and anti-social. We had to understand that there was like a difference between those two things. I think millennials will have some, some struggle understanding the difference between collaborative and codependent. However, if I think increased awareness is actually a great tool in order to get to that space of maturing and being collaborative and co-creative without being codependent. The world has to have it. We have to have accelerated awareness at this point because there's so much going on. So many things are tied together. Systems, you know, if you think in systems, so many nodes are happening all at the same time. Our world needs younger and younger people to become more hyper aware than ever before. Definitely. So it's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing that younger people are hyper aware. I think that that's a, a solid point. However, the question that Brandon asked is, oh, I can have accelerated self-awareness or awareness, but I can't seem to have accelerated maturation or accelerated growth. So how do I get there? And we were talking a little bit about it before we started recording the podcast. What does it mean? What does it look like when you have accelerated growth? And I think that's why we wanted to spend some time on the definition of what maturity looks like. Because if you know what your goal is, it's a lot easier to get there faster. And if the goal is a sense of independence. It's a sense of not relying on others to take care of you and also knowing how to respond appropriately to the environment. If that's what maturity looks like, then there are definitely ways to accelerate your maturation process. It's just a matter of, first of all, recognizing that there is always going to be limitations and resource. When it comes to anything physical, we have like time and space that we have to acknowledge. But there are tools and there are skills that can be built to mature, not maybe not as qu quickly or as fast as we do paradigmatically. Our minds are so much faster and more nimble than our bodies. And our, we have a tendency to be able to think much quicker than we do. I mean, we, we can understand and appreciate and take in information and data at a much faster rate than we can understand knowledge and wisdom. That's just how it works. But if you 
train your mind to immediately go to knowledge and wisdom, I think you can mature in an accelerated rate. Yeah, we're talking about most experience, most maturity does happen linearly. We see it in a linear fashion. And what we're talking about here is developing a way for quantum experience. This this idea of you don't have to spend 10 years getting experience. You could do it in a very accelerated amount of time, almost like in a quantum way. You just all of a sudden have a lot of experience, a lot of maturity happening very rapidly. And so I think I think one of the things that we could talk about here, if you want to, if you're someone who feels very aware, but you want to increase the maturity, you want to increase the growth, immersive experiences are going to give you that quantum leap in your understanding of things because you're testing your awareness against the real world. So that might be something like a workshop or, you know, like a, a two week process, an immersive experience where that's all you do for two weeks is work on this one thing to grow and change and develop. And you immerse yourself in that and you do it in a way that almost wears your logical mind out and you start to absorb things in a quantum way. You start to absorb the experience through just pure experience. It's no longer you're thinking about it, but you're experiencing it in real time and very, very rapidly. Yeah, it might feel like cheating calling it quantum because it still it still feels like you're using the same amount of time. You're just squeezing it into a week or two. However, we there's always a sense of erosion that happens over time. If we're learning something and it takes us six months to a year to learn it, between the moments that we chose to focus on that thing and then the next time that we chose to focus on that thing, there's going to be some erosion that happens. Now, sometimes you catch other skills and principles in the meantime that help build on that stack and understand it in maybe a more three-dimensional way. But usually... The slower process is not always the the best process. If you squeeze all that learning into a shorter amount of time, in a week or two, it becomes more quantum because you're learning things so quickly, especially in workshop settings where you're implementing immediately. In fact, I would say the the maturity happens through implementation through like concentrated implementation when you're doing something repeatedly over and over and over again in a concentrated amount of time the lessons you learn are not the same lessons you'll learn if you do it in a linear fashion where you're concentrating on it at certain times what i mean is similar to when you're learning a language like if you're taking a language lesson once a week versus immersing yourself in the country, in a country that speaks that language, you're going to pick it up so much faster when you're immersing yourself in it. And so it feels quantum. It feels like you're learning, like you're learning exponentially so much faster than if you were, you know, you were spreading that learning out. And so the same thing happens with things that help you mature. The more you can throw yourself into the process, the more you can do concentrated amounts of learning and applications specifically, then the faster you're going to mature. I think the other thing is putting yourself outside your comfort zone as a rule. In other words, all the time, every day, and this is going to be a challenge, but if you want to accelerate your growth, if that is your goal to get mature fast, then continually living outside your comfort zone, just on the edge of the comfort zone area. And what's going to happen is every day that comfort zone is going to start expanding. So you've got to push it further and push it further and push it further. But getting outside your comfort zone put you in a place where you're getting feedback and every time that comfort zone, imagine it like a circle around you, you know, that stretches and you try to live just outside that circle and now you've pushed and you've stretched and that circle expands to include what you just stretched yourself to. Now you're able to accelerate. You're, you're able to build upon the last place you were just at. So you just got outside your comfort zone, level B maybe. Now you're able to use level B to piggyback to level C. You couldn't gotten to C until you get to B first. So you're able to get a rapid progression. And living outside your comfort zone is a way to do that. I think the other thing is, is seek conflict. Most people in life run from conflict. We don't like conflict. We avoid it. We hate those difficult conversations. We hate the difficult emotions that come up for us, those conflicting emotions or those thoughts that conflict with us or the things that happen in the external world, the behaviors of others. We, we avoid them. We don't like conflict. But running toward conflict, this plays in with that comfort zone thing, running toward conflict actually grows you very fast. Conflict is what makes the human experience interesting. Like we watch movies and television programs and read novels and stories 
about conflict because we know deep down in our unconscious mind, conflict is what moves us forward as humanity. So seek out conflict. You have awareness. Now put yourself in places where you will be conflicted on a regular basis. And that will also put you outside your comfort zone. Oh, yeah. You, that's a great point. I hadn't thought about that. But I think, you, I think you're onto something there, especially looking at the, you know, through the lens of cognitive functions. You just mentioned that not all conflicts, or you, you didn't say this, but I inferred what you were saying, not all conflict is necessarily specifically like conflict between two people. It's not always like maybe a misunderstanding. There can also be conflict when it comes to thoughts, seeking thoughts that conflict with what you currently are thinking. Oh, yeah. There can be internal conflict, putting yourself in situations that make you feel conflicted. I had this happen to me yesterday. I had a very intense emotion come up for me to where it overwhelmed me to the point where I was trying to find ways to distract myself away from it. It was a conflicting emotion, very intense, overwhelmed me. And I was, I was getting ready to try to find something to distract or to divert from it. And I thought, no, I want to go ahead and delve into this emotion for myself. So I went into, the, into my bedroom. I put headphones in. I put some music on. I sat cross-legged on the bed and I allowed that conflict, the emotions inside of me to come up. And it felt like sandpaper of emotions rubbing against each other. It was, it was a horrible feeling. But I allowed that full expression to come out. I ended up crying, like sobbing for like 20 minutes or so listening to music, letting that all handle itself. And now I feel great afterward. Like I just let that process happen. And I feel like I grew through that. I feel like the things that were giving me sadness or depression or whatever at the moment, I was really struggling with some of this difficulty. It purged it through because I was running toward the conflict I would have normally avoided in my life. Right. So you did introverted feeling conflict resolution. And so for me, as an ENTP, I would be using introverted thinking conflict resolution, which is understanding cognitive dissonance. That's what conflict resolution in thought would be, is cognitive dissonance. And confronting those things you're lying to yourself about. Totally. Extroverted feeling conflict would actually be conflict between people. And conflict resolution is an amazing way to grow your extroverted feeling. And then I would imagine con like like people resource conflict when it comes to trying to get a task done or even trying to figure out which pro projects that you'll be working on would be an extroverted thinking uh, conflict resolution. So yeah, absolutely. Putting yourself in the path of conflict. You know, that makes me think of Samuel Beckett's quote that I love so much, which is ever tried, ever failed, no matter, try again, fail again, fail better. And I think one of the paths to true maturity is giving yourself the permission to fail again and fail better. Like putting yourself in situations where there is conflict and figuring it out and then maybe failing through that and then learning the lessons from the failure and then now having a better idea of how to, you know, apply what you learned to the next situation. In fact, I, I referenced the model earlier, but I said it very quickly, so you probably didn't catch it. But the, there's a model called DIKW. Each letter refers to a different aspect of a relationship with information. The first level is D stands for data. Data. The second one is I for information. K stands for knowledge and W stands for wisdom. And then there's another one some people add, which is U for understanding. So these are various levels that we have with our relationship with things, how things work essentially. And most of the time when somebody has high awareness but low maturity, it's usually that they have a lot of data or information. And data and information can make you think you're in the know. It can trick you into believing you're in the know. But you don't really get to maturity until you get to knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge is applied information and wisdom is the discretion to know when to use it. So if you're looking for maturity, well, and understanding is having implemented the wisdom and then you know the outcome. That's understanding. So if you're really looking for ways to mature, it's a, it's a matter of application, always, always, always. And those concentrated amounts of time when you put yourself in a, in a situation where you're constantly over and over again allowing yourself to fail, applying your data and information, applying it over and over and over again and watching what actually pans out and what, what was completely theor theoretical and which one pans out in which context and knowing the differences in the context and knowing you know the, the wisdom piece and the understanding piece of having done it and then being able to look back and see all the lessons taken from it. The faster you do that, the faster you're applying your data and information, the faster you're going to get to knowledge, wisdom, and understanding and then you're going to see yourself not just being aware but actually being mature. 
Yeah, all awareness is not created equal. I mean, that's a great point you just made. It's awareness for its own sake doesn't do much for us. It's focused, intentional, and I would add frameworked awareness. I mean, one of the things that's why we love doing what we do here at Personality Hacker. We we work and teach and deal with frameworks and models of seeing the world. These are maps and tools for us to make sense of the terrain that we all have to live in. Just like a map is not the actual space you're walking through. If you have a map of the country you live in, it's a reference point for you to be able to move between cities and towns and take roads and trails and things you need to get around with. A map gives you information on how to navigate the real world. And so awareness, if you can give yourself particular awareness using frameworks, some of the frameworks we teach here at Personality Hacker, but also frameworks outside of this, you know, this frame, this what we talk about here, add those into your repertoire and that will increase your ability to accelerate your growth, your maturity, because you have the right type of awareness. You have awareness that allows you to hang your experiences on a framework, can make sense of it, can organize it so you can look at it, dissect it and grow from it. It's just like when you learn a language, a second language, you know, in high school, you now have the ability to take how you learned that language and apply it to learning a third language. Typically, once you learn how to learn a language, you can accelerate learning more languages because you have the basics of that first time you did it. So when you f- first start to learn frameworks like Myers-Briggs and your personality type and how that works at a fundamental level, like cognitive functions, we talk about all the time here at Personality Hacker. Once you learn one framework or system, it's much easier to take the same principles you use to learn that system and apply it to other systems like the Graves model or spiral dynamics or the Enneagram or other different disciplines and models and frameworks. They start to accelerate. You start to use those. And now you take all these and when you move through the world with that experience, that quantum experience, immersive experience, running toward conflict, getting outside your comfort zone, you now have a place like a map to put all those things on. And it helps you learn and understand what's happening much faster. So awareness, again, is key. It's the right kind of awareness using frameworks and models in your understanding. Yeah, I would agree. In fact, I would say that the game changer framework for me was systems thinking. But what helped me understand systems thinking was all the other models I had learned beforehand. They primed me for understanding how things work systemically so that when I learned system thinking, it be- it was like super clear to me immediately. And system thinking has, I think, a tr- contributed to my maturity like gangbusters. I feel like I have so much more uh, awareness and understanding. I have so much more understanding of how things operate. I'm so much more patient with information. I'm, I'm patient with the, with the things that I see. I don't rush to action nearly as much because I understand that there's a lot more going on than I could even begin to imagine. So instead of making assumptions about cause effect, oh, like you did this, so then this thing happens. I recognize that that is that is an illusion. There are no cause effects. There are dynamic emergent properties of systems and it was a game changer for me and I do I really believe that it helped me not just have an awareness but also maturity that went along with the awareness one final thing I'll say is for me another piece of rapid growth has been clarity of outcome being very specific with the outcome I want and I and I mean this in a very particular way let's say you and I are in a disagreement Antonia and I'm feeling bad about our disagreement and I'm tempted to emotionally punish you by giving you the, the cold shoulder, maybe the silent treatment, or make a snide remark while I'm doing dishes next to you while you're cooking dinner or something. Like I'm, I'm emoting badly, or I'm ignoring you, or I'm treating you in a way that I'm trying to communicate the emotion to you of something. And I stop and I say, what is the clarity of outcome? What is the outcome? And this is what I've been doing lately, like when, I, when I'm tempted to do that. What is the outcome I'm hoping to get from this? Like if I give you the cold shoulder, we've been in a disagreement and I give you the cold shoulder for you know an hour or something, what do I hope to gain out of that? And I really get clear about what I think that's going to get me. Because once I have clarity around what that thing is probably going to get me, my behavior is going to get me at the end of it, I can approach it much more maturely because I can say, I think what I need is connection from her. I want her to validate my feelings and the disagreement we just had. My clarity of outcome is I want her to validate my feelings and acknowledge the parts of where I was right in that argument 
and then we get to reconnect. And instead of giving you the cold shoulder, a mature mind would say, in my mature mind, as I'm maturing, I say, oh, well, I can just go directly for the thing I want because I have clarity about what it is that I want out of this interaction. And then I can say, you know what? This is stupid. I can sense, and I've actually said this to you before, I can sense I'm wanting to give you the cold shoulder right now. I don't want to do that because what I need from you is validation of my emotions. I need connection and I want us to get along again. I want us to be able to you know, be back in intimacy. And I'll short circuit the bad behavior to go directly for what I want. So, and that can expand and contract depending on your situation in your life or whatever. But what is it that you want? What clarity do you have about what you're going for? And I think that's going to help you grow fast as well. That brings up yet another thing. I, we have a lot to say on this topic. <laughs> uh, that makes me think of the principle of hanging out with people who are where you want to be. Because you doing that has increased my emotional maturity because I've observed you do that. And so my my behavior, I, I mean, I don't want to be left in the dust. I don't want to be the emotionally immature person who's acting like a douchebag and throwing temper tantrums. I want to be like you. So I observe your behavior and I emulate it. And so therefore, I help. it helps me become emotionally mature. So I think also hanging out with people who show up in mature ways I think that that definitely rubs off on you. I would say for me, the final thought on this is one of the things that seems to help people mature the fastest is ego work. Really understanding what the ego is and how it puts us in its grip so badly. Our ego being the part of us that holds our identity, that wants to live that believe that our death will be the greatest tragedy in the world, feel like constantly basically indulging the ego and it's in the moment needs is probably the fastest way to become completely immature. And one of the ways to become quite mature, the, one of the fastest ways to become mature is to deny the ego its self-indulgent pursuits. To recognize its job, to think it's for, thank it for its service, to recognize its place, and to not be its victim, to not hand yourself over to your own ego. And a great way to do this is through meditation, as you mentioned. Meditation is a great way to get there. And a little bit more, well, not a little bit, quite a bit more controversially is through psychotropics. Now, psychotropics in most states in the United States, in fact, if not all of them, no, actually marijuana or cannabis is considered a psychotropic, which is legal in now, what, five different states? In the United States. I don't know about the global scope of things. That's why I keep saying the states, right? Because I'm referring to the country in which we live. Uh, And it varies all over the world. And in the country that we live in, cannabis is becoming like more and more accessible and not as controversial because it's becoming legal. And so cannabis, um, other psychotropics are in various states of legal and illegal, depending upon the country that you're in and the state that you're in, if you're in the United States. But psychotropics are incredibly powerful tools for ego work. And there is quite a bit of maturing that can happen quite quickly. Now, this is not to say that every psychotropics are for everyone, that every context of using them is going to get you from zero to 100 in maturation. I'm not trying to indicate that, but they are a very successful tool for a lot of people to focus on ego work. So that is also a possibility if you're trying to accelerate your growth path. Yeah, my just a, just a quick cautionary note. If that's something you're going to go down, you're listening and that sounds interesting to you, just be very mindful that your set and your setting is important for that work. I know people that have done things like this and they have told me that you need to be in the correct set and setting. Otherwise, that can be, it's not necessarily physically damaging or harmful, but it can definitely open up parts of your mind and it can be quite uh, quite intense, I guess would be the word I would use. So just use caution and make sure that you may have someone that guides you through the process, especially if it's a first time and it's in a proper set and setting. It's not something you do at a party or something like that. That's not really where you want to do ego work and do you know, psychotropic type drugs or anything like this. I think you want to do it in a, in a proper place and time. It's a powerful tool and it needs to be respected as such. I mean, it's a bandsaw. Right. Like you're not just going to like flail that around in a casual setting. Like yeah. there's a very specific thing that a bandsaw does and you have to be quite careful and takes, you know, cautious measurements. 
and you need to be wearing the right equipment. <laughs> like there's a lot yeah. of things that you have to take into consideration when you use a bandsaw. And it's the same thing with psychotropics. There are things that you need to take into consideration in preparation for the use. Um, because just like a bandsaw, if you are cavalier with it, there could be some pretty negative consequences. So that is, but that is one possibility amongst many. And again, like I said, meditation is a very powerful tool as well. Meditation takes a little longer, but it will, it will also help you go down the path of ego transcendent work and very powerful and a little less controversial and a little less dangerous when done improperly. So there are a lot of different tools out there to help with accelerated growth when it comes to your maturation. Obviously, we had a ton to say on the topic. Yeah. Probably should have made it a full podcast. <laughs> but I think this has been a really good question and a great PHQ. Yeah, Brandon, thanks so much for the question. I think this has been a, a good discussion. If if you listening have something you'd like to say about this, we'd invite you to come over, ask a question, leave a comment directly below the show at personalityhacker.com. And we want to hear from you. You are part of this discussion. You don't have a microphone right now, but we do want to hear back from you. And if you've got your own question, feel free to go over to personalityhacker.com forward slash questions. And you can record a question just like Brandon did here on the podcast and also write your question in. If you don't have a microphone or you're not wanting to record your voice, you can totally do that. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. This has been PHQ, Questions from the Personality Hacker Community. We will talk with you on the next episode. 